Please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll be looking down at verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we will be at verse 7. After we've read our text, we'll do just a little bit of review. Though we are in just a short series right now, it's important to kind of remember the other parts of this message. This is one of those messages that's too big to preach one time. It's been stretched into three and now four uh, weeks instead of one week. And it's possible, would be possible to preach it all at once, but I think sometimes too much can be overwhelming when you just kind of throw a lot of facts at a person. There's too much to absorb in a short amount of time. And so if you could go to 1 Corinthians and chapter 1, and then everybody's there, just kind of glance up. Why do they always say when you're there, look up? When you look up, you lose your place. Everybody looking up? Now look down, verse 7. Uh, <laughs> so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting... Uh, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's go ahead and pray, and then we will uh, get right into our message tonight. Father, it's important for us to recognize how vitally important it is that we be ready when the Lord Jesus comes. And I pray that you would help us to look for Jesus coming, more so than we ever have before as a result of an understanding of the present day and age in which we live. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we looked at last days, didn't we? Looked at the phrase, last days. And actually, was last, those were last days I was here. I left... Uh, about what we leave about 11 p.m. that night, Melissa, and got back this morning. But uh, the last days, we talked about last week. And we saw, if you want to just summarize the importance of the reality, we saw that the last days in the Scripture is a reference to the day that we live in. That is, beginning from the age when the church really began to be that institution through which Christ which Christ had established by the apostles and the institution through which God is working. And God has been working in the last days through the church. And one of the things that we saw that is a transformational truth. Really one of those truths that to transcends, a transcendent truth is how vitally important it is that we not live in the past, that we not live in the future, but that we instead live in the present. I'll tell you, folks, you want to frustrate children, you want to uh, provoke children to leave the church and get away from serving God, live in the past. Live in the past. Rob them of their present and uh, reject the future. I don't know how many times as a young person I was told of the great things God had previously done by church people. Boy, back in the day, you know, God was working, people were getting saved, and I'll tell you, it just seemed like it just seemed like everybody was moving toward God. And uh, you know, those those days are long gone now. And uh, you know, I wish they were. You go and talk to somebody. Hey, how'd you like to go soul winning? Well, I remember back when we had soul winning, man, we had people baptized every Sunday, and we saw people coming down the aisle, and people, uh, lives, people's lives changing, and we saw amazing things, and, you know, I wish, I wish, you know, we were still living in those days. Now, you'll, you'll ruin your future living in the past. You'll ruin your present living in the past. If you don't live now, you'll never have a good past, and... <laughs> your future will never be any better than it is. And so as we saw that how important it is for us to understand, we looked at the references in the New Testament to the phrase the last days, and we come to realize that we're in the last days. And the last days are reference to the church age. Okay, the second area of application for that as well is that we need to understand the institution that Christ is using today. God has, we saw in Hebrews has in other times, in different ages, used different institutions, hasn't he? Like Israel. My friend, I don't mean this unkindly at all, 
But God isn't using Israel today. God is not working. God's Holy Spirit is not moving through national Israel today. God isn't in the temple. And worship isn't happening through, a pe through the people. Today, God is working through the church and the other nations that have been adopted in are going to be a part of future Israel. So God in the past worked through Israel. God in the future will work with Israel. But today, my friend, God's working with the church. And yet, large amounts of time broadcasting and preaching and teaching are talking about Israel in the past and Israel in the future and entirely absolving the responsibility of believers to live as part of the glorious institution which God is going to present to Himself without spot and wrinkle, and that's the church. And so we ought to love the church like Jesus does. Uh, I personally, uh, I don't think I'm angry about it anymore, but I'm fed up with the Messianic movement. I don't have any use for it at all. You want to get involved with worshiping God in an institution that He's not using? My friend, you've set up a pagan form of worship. You may be a believer in Jesus as your Messiah. You may be a completed Jew. But my friend, you're part of the church. God's not working through Israel today. And it's not reaching lost Jewish folks. You say, well, there's lost Jewish folks that are getting reached. No, my friend, you don't have a better way of reaching people than Jesus does. And God's reaching people through his church. And so we need to live in the present, not in the past and not in the future. And that's really where we ended up last week. I want to look at just a singular word uh, that does, isn't, doesn't come out uh, in every one of the texts, but is in some of the texts we'll look at tonight. And that's the word hope. The word hope. I hope that you know how to understand the definition of the word hope in a very dissimilar usage than what I just used it in. In other words, when I said, I hope that you, what do I mean by that? It's your wish. It's my wish. But I'll be frank with you tonight, I'm not confident everyone is awake and engaged enough or cares enough <laughs> to actually leave here with the definition of hope or with an understanding of what we're teaching. In other words, it may be that you have a different motive than... Uh, getting everything that's preached tonight and, and applying it. It might be you came to church tonight as a reflex or something like that. That is possible. So when I say I hope, I'm saying I wish or it is my fondest desire that it would be so. But that does not mean it will be so. The word hope in the Scripture is used differently. The word hope in the Scripture is used to indicate that this is a future event which I am anticipating and looking forward to uh, with great anticipation. See the difference? In other words, this will happen, and I'm looking forward to its happening. See, that's what eternal life is for us. Uh, my lost loved ones, the folks that have gone before me that are already in heaven, that I'm not going to prevent uh, their physical resurrection. That is, I have lost loved ones in my lifetime whose bodies are planted in the ground. And they're planted as seeds which are going to, that, that have died, but are going to germinate or going to be resurrected. The Bible says that my body ascending when the Lord Jesus comes is not going to prevent their bodies. In other words, my body is not going to go before their bodies. So if I'm living and I hope that I will be, in other words, I believe I will be, and I look forward to being alive when the Lord Jesus returns to take up the saints. I'm commanded to believe that in the Scripture. And I believe that will be so. And so my loved ones, which I could give you a long list of, that are in the ground, they're going to come out of the ground first. We were discussing this last week. Somebody asked me a question about aliens. They said, Pastor, what do you think about aliens? Or do you think it's possible that there's life on other planets? And the simple answer to that is that it would be out of the character of God uh, for Him to create someone in His image and then to make other people in His own image. Was the sacrifice of Calvary being what it is and, God, and the redemption plan? Can you imagine God redeeming another species? by sacrificing His own Son. That would rather make light of the work of the cross, wouldn't it? And so, uh, my simple answer is, I believe it would be out of the character of God to make so much of man and then just create other intelligent life like man made in His own image on other planets at the same time. I don't believe so. I, 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 there are a lot of reasons why I know that there's not uh, life on planets unless we put life there. Uh, and, and that would be, I think, a future thing. I, the reason I, I know it's not so is because it's just out of the character of God. And I do know God well enough to know I would be outside of His character. Now, 
uh, the question though was, you know, why, what is the deal with the aliens and why are so many people fascinated with Martians and like there's their whole movements right now. By the way, I'm trying to figure out a way to capitalize on. I want to make some money off of it. There's a whole <laughs> movement of people that believe that there are aliens, and uh, and the, the word that they used actually was the word zombie. Bodies coming out. There, there are there are the zombie movement of people that believe in zombies and believe in a zombie apocalypse. So you think it's just a video game joke, but actually there's a lot of video game people that actually believe in it. And they're actually concerned about bodies coming up out of the graves inhabited by devils and uh, being dangerous and needing to be shot and so forth. Uh, I want to make some money off it, but I want to tell you something. There is going to be something like a zombie apocalypse someday. Someday the graves are going to be open and the saints would sleep. Their bodies are coming out of the graves. And I, if they want to call it a zombie apocalypse, they can, but it'll be resurrected saints. That'll be when God resurrects the bodies of the saints. And they're going to go up in a very visible fashion, and we're going to go right along with them, but we're not going to prevent them, which are asleep. But that's a marvelous truth that I anticipate, that I look forward to with great anticipation. Do you not as well? And that was tied in with one of the questions that was asked, which is how important is burial for a Christian? versus cremation. I'd say very important because if you bury me, I want a tomb somewhere telling people this body's going to come out. I'm going to rise. You wait here. You watch here and wait for a zombie. And uh, I'll be one. But it won't be a zombie. It'll be me. And you'll never kill me when I come out of the grave, my friend, because I have eternal life. Now, I'm being a little bit silly about a lot of that, but there are some real truths. And I think, I'm not a conspiracist. I don't spend a lot of time trying to think about what unbelievers are doing that's evil to try to thwart God's plan because no one can thwart God's plan even if they want to. So if they're trying to say, well, you know, there are going to be, there's intelligent life or there are zombies that are going to come out of the grave and that's a way of trying to explain away the resurrection, my friend, that only works for people that want to believe lies. And so if they want to thwart God's plan by having an alternate explanation for it, uh, so be it. Have at it if you like to. But people that can have eyes open to see the truth will know what the truth is anyway. And people that want to believe lies will believe whatever lie they want to believe anyway. And so that's free. It's for you and we want you to have it. All right. <laughs> uh, it's important for us, though, as believers to recognize the day and age in which we live and to realize that we're in the last days, but what we're hoping for is for Jesus Christ to come. And the next event on God's calendar will be for the Lord Jesus Christ to be in the sky where we meet the Lord in the air. My friend, that is a very distinctly different occurrence than when the Lord Jesus comes and touches down on the ground and it splits beneath His feet. It's a massively different occurrence. It is a resurrection of the bodies of the saints and a taking up of the living saints. And it is because the tribulation is not for mankind. Now, I'm somewhat hesitant nowadays because of the nonsense that's taught about the tribulation, even use the term tribulation, because that isn't what the Bible calls it. The word tribulation is just a word. And in context of great tribulation, which is talking about the future event where God is judging the wicked, then it fits appropriately so. But sometimes the word tribulation just is a reference to the things which saints go through and suffer at the hands of the wicked. And we, dist we, we, we uh, distinguished, uh, or made two distinctions, that's the right way to say it. We made two distinct, or a, a clear distinction between the two types of tribulation a couple of weeks ago. Does anybody remember what the distinction between the tribute types of tribulation are? That is in time events first. Yes? One is man-made and one is God-made. Yes. Very good. Textbook answer. The distinct differences in tribulation is, it's one thing when evil is the cause of tribulation and it's causing uh, saints to go through tribulation and God is able to take evil and work it for good. That is very different than when God is judging the wicked and they're going through great tribulation. Isn't it so? You say, Pastor, don't you know that sometimes God, it is in His good will for us to go through valleys for us to go through dark times, for us to go through uh, some 
judgment or chastisement. Oh yes, I know that it's so. I know that oftentimes... I, listen, friend, mountaintops in a Christian life would not only be boring, they would be meaningless if it weren't for valleys. But there's a big difference between God taking us through evil and God doing evil. And the Bible says, let no man say when he's tempted, this is James, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. My friend, God's not playing silly games of torturing His children. Sometimes God allows us to go through circumstances for which we need His grace. And they cause us to grow in Him and to look to Him and to know Him. And then we see uh, God's perfect plan unfold through those circumstances. But that's vastly different than God dealing with the wicked as He does so. And we see in the prophecies of future events and in the revelation. You see the difference. And so that would be a major distinction. Sometimes I don't like words like tribulation because people make doctrines out of words. And it's a silly thing, thing to do. It's very uneducated. Every word uh, has a meaning and every word also has a context. And sometimes a word's meaning can be understood through its context or because of its context. But my friend, the, you, you can't work the circle. You can't say every time the word tribulation is used, it means this. And then again, playing the silly game of where's the word rapture found in the Bible. Well, there are a lot of words that aren't in the Bible. Matter of fact, I personally, partly because, partially because of my poor memory and not knowing what you're talking about when you use strange words, don't like labels for doctrinal positions and so forth. I know what a Gnostic is, but I just don't think it's a good label. Why not just say what a Gnostic believes? I know what a preterist is, but why not just, why, why take a Latin word and turn it into a noun when it's not really a word at all and it doesn't really have its own meaning? Why not just say what you're talking about? A lot of people, I think, think that giving a label to something uh, makes it uh, more official or complex or titled or something like that. I don't know. Some folks are big into acronyms and labels. The reality of it is the word only means what it means and it only has the range of meaning which is allowed within its definition and within its context. And the word rapture, my friend, is not found anywhere in your English Bible. That is not in reference to the snatching up or the taking away of the saints. But the word that means snatching up is found in your Bible. And the word, by the way, Trinity is not found in your Bible anywhere either. And that will be the next thing that people who think they're fundamentalist Baptists are going to attack and challenge. You mark my words. The reality of it is, is that nonsense is nonsense. And making something out of a word instead of studying the Bible to see what it says is foolishness. And to make the tribulation have only the range of meaning uh, that you cherry pick the context of and define and then everything else that says tribulation fits in that context, my friend, is not only a serious mistake, but it's an egregious error. Okay, <laughs> I just want to look at one thing this evening. And we'll look at it from a couple of verses beginning in 1 Corinthians 1, 7. And that would be hope. Hope for Christ coming. Why is this a transcendent truth? Well, we saw last week that if a person does not hope for the coming of the Lord Jesus, he's not going to be ready when Jesus comes. And we saw as well uh, the arrogance, the arrogant mindset that says, anything God throws at me, I can survive. If the wicked can survive it, so can I. That's arrogant, isn't it? For us to, to think that we can go through God's judgment or withstand God's judgment. My friend, the wicked won't withstand God's judgment and neither could I. Alright, now, verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you've spent a lot of time in this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, you know that Paul doesn't have a lot of gracious, kind things to say to this church at this time. Albeit, I believe the church in Corinth is perhaps nearest and dearest in Paul's heart of all the churches. Paul's very, very proud of the church at Thessalonica and the church at Macedonia and so forth and has great commendations for them. But if you just remember back to the history of the church in Corinth, Paul was at that place, that, that uh, really crossing point in his ministry when he was ready just to reject the Jews entirely for preaching the gospel to, and it become to the point of actually frustration, bitterness, and anger at, the, at his kinsmen according to flesh. And he said, I'm done 
preaching the gospel to Jews, and I'm only going to preach the gospel to Gentiles. I'm finished with you all. You're hard-hearted. Uh, you don't respond to truth, and you're not any good for anything. And uh, henceforth I'll preach to the Gentiles. And then he goes and stays in a man's house which had joined itself to a synagogue. And the, the guy who ran the synagogue inquired about the gospel and got saved. And a lot of the Jews got saved. And Paul had peace there in Corinth and actually stayed there, what was it, a year and a half? I mean, the guy wasn't used to, to you know, he'd come in in a couple of hours of preaching the gospel and proving that Jesus is Christ from the Scriptures. Shortly after she proving that Jesus is Christ, man, I'm telling you, people would start believing and all of a sudden an insurrection would be raised up against him and a mob would come and try to kill him. And that happened in a very, very short time, every time Paul came to town. But he actually got to remain at Corinth and spend time in that church with those people that were open to the gospel and willing to hear it. And it was a time of rest and peace in Paul's ministry. And so I can't help but think, as Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth, though he has some scathing, very, very authoritative things to say to them about things they're wrong about, I can't help but think uh, that this is sort of one of those things where they're family, so... Since I know them well, I'm going to tell them the things they need to hear. And, but that part of the letter hasn't started yet, and Paul has commended them about something. Look at verse 5, verse 4. He said, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. And here's the application of what Paul's thanking them for. He said, So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, An area that you are not behind anyone in is this mindset of looking, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, if you were to ha have a test or a quiz that asked the question, what was the thing Paul commended the church in the first letter to Corinth for? Well, he had a lot of things to say wrong about them, but he said the one thing that you're doing right is you're looking for Jesus to come. The one thing you're doing right is you're looking for Jesus to come. And my friend, that's an important commendation. Could we say then that the doctrine or the teaching of hope the doctrine of looking for the Lord Jesus to come is something that God values and is an important transcendent truth in the life of a believer. Is it so? Well, yes, it is. Let's look at a couple of other places. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, will you please? Romans chapter 8, just before 1 Corinthians. Romans chapter 8. And uh, you cannot read the entire passage uh, but let's go ahead and look at beginning in uh, verse 17 to gather a little context. Verse 17, the Bible begins this context by saying, If children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so that be that we may suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, Paul is introducing us to an understanding that saints suffer he himself suffered, and he is talking about something that the church shared with him. We suffer together, and we share with Jesus as well, because Jesus suffered for us. And now we've, we've seen many times, first of all, Jesus saying, if they hated me, they'll hate you. And a servant is not greater than his master, disciples not greater uh, than, uh, than his Lord. And so if Jesus suffers, it's, it's something that we have in common with him when we suffer. So he brings up this matter of suffering, but something that's kind of a mind-blowing concept to me is this matter of errors or joint errors with Christ. In other words, we are equal. The word joint error carries with it the idea of equal errors with Christ. And it carries with it the notion more of inheriting something together rather than inheriting something and dividing it up. In other words, God isn't going to divide up heaven and say, well, you know, you get this and you get this and you get this. No, it's going to be ours. It's going to be ours. It's always a neat thing to kind of have something together with a family, isn't it? It's kind of cool. Uh, I had friends growing up that their family had a cabin. 
Uh, they had a cabin out uh, in the middle of a pond. And it was a, just a fun place. Because they owned it, we were friends with them. Sometimes on the weekends, all of us teenagers would go out there and we'd fish and fool around, have bonfires, and stay out at the cabin and, and uh, probably get in less trouble because uh, than you would in town, I suppose, but do as much as we could to get in trouble. We had a good time out there. And it was a family cabin. Uh, uh, some years back, I had the privilege of going up to an estate in Virginia which was deeded by King George to the family that owns it. And the family doesn't actually live on the st estate, but it was the Maymont estate. I got to deer hunt with a friend of mine. And I just thought it's really cool. This big family owns this estate. Beautiful estate, I think 750 acres of, of really beautiful Virginia. And uh, just a gorgeous, gorgeous area. And the old family house and all that. And you say, well, who does it belong to? Well, it doesn't belong to any one of them. They're joint heirs. It's the family's estate. It's a family estate. And so it's inherited together. And so this notion or this concept, which is taught in many places of the Scripture, that we are having the position of sons of God because the Son of God gave His life for us and gave us His place, it's a little bit mind-boggling. It's a little bit too much for me to understand the, the notion of reigning with, together with Christ and being a joint heir with Jesus Christ. But it's a family affair. It's a family deal, and we're all going to be you know, joint heirs, equals. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Uh, and, and it, of course, supports many other places in the Scripture. I'm sure that's a transcendent truth which we don't have time to preach. Verse 17, the Bible says, If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified with Him. And so we see the common sense of, hey, listen, if we suffer with Jesus, it makes sense that we'd be glorified with Jesus. But the, the reverse is also true. If we're, we expect to be glorified with Jesus, to be heirs with Christ, to not be enemies of God, then the opposite also ought to be true. You know, if you come from feudin stock, from feudin families like the Hatfields and the McCoys, uh, all you got to do to be hated by a Hatfield is to be a McCoy. And the reverse is also true, right? In other words, it doesn't matter what you've done, it's who you're, it's who, who you're identified with. And if you're identified with the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, you get to identify with everything, both the benefits as well as the enemies. And you'll find that there are people in life who hate you simply because, simply because you're identified with Jesus. This last week I got a phone call when I was in Arkansas of somebody. I couldn't hear them, unfortunately, and I didn't, they threatened me, but I didn't hear their threat very well, which was really kind of ruined my day, I guess. Not that I got threatened, but that I didn't know what they said when they threatened me, but they said something like, you're going to be sorry or you'll whatever. But it seemed as though somebody from our church had given them a tract or invited them to church, and they said I was going to pay for it. And so I don't know how I'm going to pay, uh, but that was the threat somehow that I'm going to pay. And it was really funny because I was sitting with family. I said, well, somebody, they said, what was that? I said, well, somebody just threatened me. He said, what did say? I said, I couldn't really understand. I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't hear you. And he blocked his number. I always call him back when they threaten me. But he blocked his number so I couldn't call him back. And uh, so I really didn't hear. They said, you heard me and hung up, And uh, unfortunately. Now, why did they threaten me? Do they know me personally? No. Have I ever met them or done anything to them? No. Did anybody from our church do anything mean or obnoxious to them? I seriously doubt it. Why are they angry at me? Well, they're angry at God, and they're angry at Jesus Christ, and so therefore they are angry at the Gospel. And sharing the Gospel with them and inviting them to fellowship with us made them angry. Well, it didn't make them angry. It triggered their anger, which was pent up, ready to go off. And they projected it at me. What do I have to do with what they're angry about? Well, pretty much everything, because we're family. And if you're mad at Jesus, you're mad at me. And so that ought to explain some things for us. Listen, if I get to rule and reign with Jesus Christ, it's common sense then that I'm joined here with suffering. Now listen, I'm not suffering. Matter of fact, it kind of made my day. I probably need to repent over that. But there's just something about being, uh, being handed what I usually see as empty threats that uh, amuses me. I don't know why I find it amusing. I've been threatened many times in my life. And um, it normally just... I, my wife says, somebody's going to kill you someday. You know, you need to, well, maybe they will, but I won't care about that either. You know, <laughs> to be honest with you, it just doesn't bother me too much being threatened. Uh, so, made my day. But if I, were, if I suffered, if somebody caught me in a dark alley, and uh, 
If, if, if ten people caught me in a dark alley and beat me up, <laughs> then <laughs> Taj looked like that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> okay. If, if ten very large people caught me in a dark alley <laughs> and beat me up because I'm a follower of Jesus, well, <laughs> then my friend, that's just part of being a child of God, right? That's just part of the. That's part of of. I'm gonna I'm gonna reign with Jesus someday, and being families, being joint heirs with Christ. That's what it says. But in verse 18 it says, "For I reckon that the sufferings." of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Notice verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered. So creature, just see that word is created one. Creature would be one who is created. That, if that helps you with the understanding of the word. We're not talking about a worm or, or some kind of a you know, living being, you know, like an animal. We're talking about created. We're talking about ourselves. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Notice verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now, travail is a word oftentimes which is used in the context of labor, of birth. Uh, so, so the kind of travail that, uh, that uh, God told, this, the, told Eve that she would have when being with child. And so part of the curse. In verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of the body. Now had you been reading Romans all the way up until this point, you would have just seen Paul's dissertation on the things that he wanted to do, he didn't do, and the things that he didn't want to do, he did. And he's talking in the context of sin and victory over sin. And he's talking about the reality that though we are sealed by the Spirit of God, though we are redeemed by the Spirit of God, while we're on this earth in an untranslated state or unredeemed state with regard to our bodies, the Spirit is a seal of our redemption, but these bodies are still cursed. And it is irritating on some days to live in a cursed body, isn't it so? Amen. Listen, where's pain come from? Well, it comes from living in a cursed body. Where does the struggle uh, of the flesh versus the Spirit come from? Well, it comes from living in an unredeemed body. Listen, our souls have been redeemed, but my friend, our bodies have not yet. And we groan some days. Well, <laughs> We groan every day. My wife will tell you, some nights I groan in the middle of the night because of the unredemption of the physical body. And when I get up in the morning, man, I just... Uh, I have all the grunts and the groans. And When I see the word groan, I think that's exactly what I do. We groan when a crab pinches our finger. Don't we, Anthony? Anthony's out. There you go. Uh, the, the body uh, groans, uh, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body, of our body. Verse 24 and 5 is where we're getting to. For we are saved or delivered by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And a lot of times we only want to relate to the things that we can see with our eyes or comprehend with our minds. And that isn't hope. That isn't what hope is. Hope is something which cannot be seen being looked forward to because of a faith that's in us. See, hope is begotten in us by faith. Look at verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And then we see likewise the Spirit also helpeth us with our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for we, as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. So we see the, the ministry of God's Spirit in helping us with these weaknesses. But we see 
that one of the things that is supposed to be a driving force or factor in a Christian having victory over sin in their life is this matter of hope for the redemption of the body. Hope for the redemption of the body. Now I have some little cliche things that I like to say sometimes, but I'm only half joking when I say them. I've said many times to people, I've only got to get this body to make it to the grave or to the rapture. You know, I, I actually have some goals as far as uh, my body making it. I would like to have my teeth. I'd like to just keep my teeth. I, I mean, I'm just telling you personal goals. None of these may not be your goals. You may have already failed in these goals. It's too late already. But I, I've got all my own teeth and I don't have any cavities in them. And I like having them because it makes it so that I can devour anything I'd like to. And so I like having my teeth. And I like to keep my teeth. And I've been careful not to brush them or remove any of the helpful bacteria that causes damage to your teeth. I've stayed away from the dentist who like to pull teeth and drill on them and make holes in them and weaken them by uh, polishing the enamel off of them. So I've been careful. I've done some things in preparation for this hope that I have. But if I don't make it when the Lord Jesus comes and I meet Him in the sky, my hope is that we bury my body with all its teeth intact. I'd just like to do that. Something else I've been working very hard on, more conscientiously as I get older than younger, is keeping all of my extremities. Like, I've tried not to cut off hands when I'm using saws, and I've been more careful with a chainsaw in the last few years than I have been in my whole life. And so I'm just, just trying not to lose limbs. Now, that's not a big deal. I can, you know, my body can be redeemed. If we have to bury a finger early or a hand or whatever, then it, God can handle all that. But I found out that it's inconvenient to be missing limbs for people that I know that are missing their limbs. And they've advised me, keep your limbs. And so I'm trying to keep my teeth and keep my limbs. Now, I'm being a little bit silly, but part of it's like half serious. But I do say this to people all the time when something on me gets broken or something isn't functioning the way that it should, that it ought to. And I'm, in, I'm groaning, if you will. Then I'll say something. They'll say, well, you need to take care of yourself. And I say, all I have to do is to make it until Jesus comes. Or all I have to do is make it until I die. If I make it till I die, who cares what kind of condition this body goes into the grave with? Right? You know, it's pretty interesting to go to a junkyard in the Northeast where they salt the roads. And I mean, you, you see a car in a junkyard in the Northeast, almost always the engine still runs and the transmission still works, but the frame fell apart and the body fell off it. But if you go to a junkyard here in the Southeast, and you see a car in the junkyard, oftentimes the engine's wore out and it's got high mileage, but the body still looks pretty good on you. think, oh, it's a pretty good looking car. Why is it in a junkyard? Well, it's wore out either way. Either way, though, they're in the junkyard and they're, they're heading for the crusher. They're going to be smashed about that flat uh, before very long. The end is the same regardless of whether they end looking good or looking mm -hmm. like it's falling apart. And that's kind of the way I feel about this body, mm -hmm. if it helps you understand just a little bit. In other words, I may look terrible. I've been home or two. Or I might uh, be missing some limbs, or I may not be able to walk, or I may, whatever condition I'm in, I'll make it to the grave. I promise you that. I'll get her done when it comes to dying. I've said before about dying that I think I can do it. I've witnessed enough people. I've witnessed cowards, and they get it done just as well as the people who are brave when they die. I've watched people serene and, and uh, praising God, and they're an example of death. And they go out and they just say, Oh, look, there's the Lord Jesus, and they. they uh, they go through suffering and they die in a very, very heroic way. And then I've watched people that are frustrated and screaming and crying and, and saying, I don't want to die, and they still get it done. So I figure whichever way I go, I'll get the job done. <laughs> Either way, if I die like a brave man or die like a coward, I know I can do it. And so <laughs> I don't worry about how I... Some people say, well, I want to die in my sleep. Well... I don't particularly uh, care how I die so much anymore because I figure if God wants me to, I'll get the job accomplished regardless and who am I uh, to, to not be willing to suffer when that's one of the areas I'm a joint heir of. And Christian, I want to conclude with this this evening, though we could go to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. I want to conclude with this this evening because I think it's a helpful transcendent truth for we as believers to embrace. And that is the reality that suffering sometimes is a part of our hope. That is, the things in this life that cause us to groan also remind us of what we look forward to. And can I remind you that those that are not redeemed, 
those that are not joint heirs with Jesus Christ don't have the same privilege. Small wonder individuals are chasing the elixir of youth or looking for a fountain of youth or trying to figure out some kind of a way that they can prolong their miserable, unhappy existence. Some of the most unhappy people I've ever met are so careful to preserve their miserable lives. And that's always seemed ironic to me, as does it not to you? You go to a vegan convention someday. Andrew's laughing about that. Andrew, let's me and you both go to a vegan convention. <laughs> That'd be fun, wouldn't it? Okay, go to a vegan convention. There's nothing there I can eat. <laughs> well, we'll eat the vegans if we have to. <laughs> the cannibal convention. Whatever. <laughs> we just derailed major. Derailed. Go to a vegan convention someday and find a person who does more than talk about happiness. Find someone who's satisfied in life and has deep-seated joy, serenity. The, oh, there's, there are Buddha worshipers that try to channel inner things, but you know what that's all about? That's all a farce. That's all a cover-up. Why is it that people are so careful? I'm not against healthy eating. I'm not making... Well, I'm kind of making fun of vegans, but it's not because there's anything wrong with it. It's just because I'm making fun of it because I'm not very nice sometimes. But just so we can clear, oh, it's my nice year. I'm not making fun of vegans at all. <laughs> not at all. Uh, <laughs> the reality of it, though, is that uh, why is it, why do we ask, when we ask the question, why is it that these people are trying so hard to hold on to their miserable, unhappy existence? You know, most people that, that are in those lifestyles don't really have a lot of family and friends. You start just, and this is just general, not, not a universal observation, but a general observation is that most of them are estranged from their spouses and children and family and friends, and really their whole life and their world has gotten into this <coughs> prolong my healthy lifestyle kind of thing. Why is that? That's the question, why? Miserable. Because they don't have hope. They don't have hope. In other words, they're afraid to die. They don't want to suffer. And they're afraid of death because they don't, they don't have the redemption of the soul. But we do. And as believers, you and I ought to have the perspective of, yes, it's good to take care of the body. Keep all the digits intact. Go ahead and keep all your teeth so you can eat things that vegans can't. Go ahead and whatever. That was mean, wasn't it, Andrew? But Andrew laughed, so there we go. We scored one. Anyway... <laughs> Go ahead and do those things, but all those things being mindful that we're joint heirs together with Jesus Christ and we're waiting for the adoption or the redemption of the body. Because there is a resurrection of this body. This body's going to die or it's going to be redeemed, one or the other. <laughs> but regardless of how it happens, my friend, that's the hope of a believer. Live in hope. Go ahead and put your disappointments in that. Well, I always hoped I'd have all my hair. Well, too bad, it's gone. Just go ahead and put that, but I'll have it in heaven. Right, that's my hope. Well, I always hoped I'd keep all my teeth. Well, some of them are missing. It's too late for that. But your body's going to be made new again, and God's going to make it perfect. You'll have all your teeth someday. Go ahead and look forward to that. You know, I always hoped I'd have 12 children. Well, you don't. That's probably not going to happen. And so go ahead and just put that in the thing that, you know what, I'm going to be okay. Well, I always hoped I'd be married, and I always hoped I'd, you know, my wife would die and I'd marry again. Or I always hoped... Well, <laughs> oh, my <word. laughs> People have some strange hopes, my friend. And you understand what we're saying, folks? Listen, we, we focus so much on things that are disappointments sometimes in this life because we don't remember the adoption. We don't remember the redemption and who we are. Let me ask you a question. Worst case scenario in this life, what if God doesn't give you your dream? Or what if you messed up something and it's too late? What if? What if? <laughs> Turns out pretty well for those that are joint heirs with Christ, doesn't it? My friend, that is a transcendent truth. It transcends a lot of daily events and gives you a perspective of life that makes a disappointment not one at all. Do you understand that? 
good. Let's thank God for it. God, I just thank you for hope. And I do pray that we do all understand it and are able to practically live it out. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. No, we're going to take prayer requests. You're not dismissed. You're undismissed.